fact that we have a choir, I know that a lot of churches today don't. Um, but the thing I like about having a choir is, you know, a lot of the worship songs that we sing, uh, we sing and everybody's expected to sing along. And the only question is, will you sing along when you're supposed to sing? But, you know, technically when the choir sings, they're supposed to be singing. And it kind of shifts the tables on us. And now all of a sudden we're not really actually technically supposed to be singing. And yet when you're drawn into that worship and you just listen to the words and you hear the melody, it draws you in and you find yourself humming or singing along. And I see that as worship. And so I appreciate Daryl and the choir and the wonderful job that they do. I want to invite you to turn with me to Mark, the Gospel of Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 14, and if you would please stand in honor of God's word. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let's pray. Father, I pray that that very simple but profound message would wash over us this morning and reshape and reframe the way that we see all of life, all of reality. That in the coming of Jesus, the kingdom of God has come. And it is therefore our responsibility to repent and believe in the gospel. So Lord, I pray that not a soul in this room leaves today without having trusted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Repenting of their sins and trusting in Jesus for salvation and the good news of hope. Lord, reframe, renew our thinking, but also stir up our desires to where we delight in you. We want you more than anything else. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to read today. Uh, we're kind of uh, doing a cameo appearance here of our confession and going back to it. For just a few weeks, and today we uh, put together two parts of our confession, repentance and faith, and I just want to read uh, this from our confession. I don't know if it's on the screen, but if, if not, just listen uh, to uh, our church confession in regards to repentance and faith. Repentance is an evangelical grace wherein a person being by the Holy Spirit, made sensible of the manifold evil of his sin, humbleth himself for it with godly sorrow, detestation of it, and self-abhorrence with a purpose and endeavor to walk before God so as to please him in all things. Okay? Let me read faith. And you don't have to write this down. We've got booklets that uh, we have available and you can get all this. And it's also available at tvbc.net. Um, Faith, saving faith is the belief on God's authority of whatsoever is revealed in his word concerning Christ, accepting and resting upon him alone for justification and eternal life. It is wrought in the heart by the Holy Spirit and is accompanied by all other saving graces and leads to a life of holiness. All right, so uh, I want to talk about these two things today. Um, you know, there are, in the Bible, there's two major teachings that I'm convinced the vast majority of Christians do not really know how to articulate well. And those two things are the gospel, what is the gospel, and what is faith. What is the gospel and what is faith? Um... I want to give just an example of what I'm talking about, okay? Uh, and something that I think is actually very positive. Uh, Lifeway has this uh, deal called the 
during vacation Bible school called the ABCs of VBS. And when it comes Thursday night and it gets time for presenting the gospel, uh, what is uh, usually presented are the ABCs of the Christian faith, which is, number one, admit to God that you're a sinner. Number two, believe that Jesus is God's son. And number three, confess Jesus as Lord. Now, as I see that, a lot of people are confused into thinking that that actually is the gospel. A lot of people actually believe that repentance and faith is the gospel. A lot of people think just going to heaven's the gospel, missing hell's the gospel, the fact that you're a sinner, or just that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that that encapsulates the gospel. And the problem with that is that's not what we find in the Bible itself. A lot of those things are true, most of them, in fact, I think just about everything that I said is true in some sense. But it's not what the Bible calls the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, well, what is the gospel? Well, the best way I know to say it is to say, read, the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark, Luke, and John. If you want to just know in a nutshell what is the gospel, read what we actually call the gospels. It starts out and it just tells us the story of Jesus Christ. If you wanted to do it quicker, go and read Acts chapter 2. And you'll find Peter at Pentecost preaching a sermon in which he presents the gospel. You could also go to other places such as Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, where the Apostle Paul summarizes the gospel. It's captured in a lot of creeds, one of which we just sang. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again, ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come to judge the living and the dead. So this is summarized in what's called the Apostles' Creed. In summary, what, if you come to our um, class, our covenant member class, we actually have a section on just the gospel where we have a little summary. It goes like this. The gospel is that Jesus, the crucified and risen King, is Lord. And that is to say that the kingdom of God has come in Jesus. This is why the uh, gospel of Mark begins with, Verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then skip down to our verse today. It says, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming. Okay, so let's see. What is Jesus preaching? What is Jesus proclaiming? It says, the gospel of God. Now, the word gospel just very simply means good news. So he's proclaiming the good news of God, saying, what is he saying? The time is Fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel is about the kingdom of God coming in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, you say, okay, well, what about repentance and faith? Intrinsically connected to the gospel, absolutely. But it's very important to understand as we look at this passage today that it is a response to the gospel, not the gospel in and of itself. Because the gospel is not about you and what you can do. And it's not about what you and what's happening to you. It's about who God is and about what God has done in his beloved son, Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring about his kingdom on earth. This is the gospel. And so Jesus says, repent and believe in the gospel, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Every person can understand repentance and faith by grasping for biblical truths. Every person can understand repentance and faith by grasping for truths. Truth number one, repentance and faith signify turning. It is a turning point in your life, okay? That's what repentance is all about. 
And that's why many other places in the Bible, it inserts that word turn in place of repent. Turn over with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. As it just so happens, this was part of my Bible reading this morning. And it just struck me. I started, I believe, in Acts chapter 24 or something, and I started reading uh, this morning. And it struck me that uh, Paul was so dangerous in the ancient world because of his boldness in preaching the gospel that they literally had to round up a 200-man army just to get him from point A to point B. Now, folks, if you want to aspire to something in the Christian life, be so dangerous in your presentation of the gospel that you cause riots anywhere you go. There's a, I've told you before, there's a New Testament uh, theologian uh, that he's what you would call a Pauline scholar, and he goes around teaching about the Apostle Paul, and he said, you know, everywhere Paul went, uh, he started a riot, and he said, and everywhere I go to talk about him, they serve tea and cake. So... Uh, there, there's some disconnect today, perhaps, but the reality is we are talking about someone bold in the faith. And he is giving this presentation before the emperor. And look at Acts chapter 26 and skip on down to verse 16. It says, But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose to appoint you as servant and witness. He's talking about his commissioning from the Lord to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, listen to this, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Verse 19, therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. So this is your life is oriented one direction, you are headed one direction, and repentance and faith means turning. And it's not just some abstract theological idea that we like to talk about on Sunday morning. It is reflected in the way that your life changes thereafter. Your orientation is one way one day, and it is a different way the next day. The trajectory of your life changes. It's not to say that after that you don't sin, you don't stumble, you don't fall. You certainly do. I think any honest person in this room would admit that. But the reality is the trajectory of your life turns. You go from being a lover of self, pleasure, money, sex, power, fame, and all of these things. You go from loving those things and delighting in those things to loving God. And that being what wakes you up in the morning and what puts you down to sleep. Because it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the Lord. And when you're converted... There is a turning, as the Apostle Paul says, your eyes are open so that you see who you are, and most importantly, so that you see who God is. And it says you turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God to receive forgiveness of sins in a place among those who are sanctified. If you would receive forgiveness of sins this morning, you must repent. And that's why when Jesus goes about preaching about how the kingdom of the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come, repent and believe in the gospel. That's why he says that, because you don't want to be a rebel in the coming of God's kingdom. You don't want to find yourself against, opposed to the things of God. And to not take a side is to take a side on this issue. It's amazing what they thought about back then compared to what we fight about today and what we argue about today. We argue about any number of trivial things and some very important things. But what, as we read the book of Acts, what we see the Apostle Paul spending his days worried about 
is making sure people understand that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead. That was the crux of his reasoning. That was the crux of his message in everything that he did in life. And I wonder today if it's mine and if it's yours. Truth number two. Repentance and faith are a grace. Now, this is something that might be difficult for uh, us to comprehend because, well, th this is me. This is on me. It says in our confession, repentance is an evangelical grace. That means it's by God's grace that you have the opportunity to repent anyway. So it's not that you're smarter than your neighbor. It's not that you're better than your neighbor. It's not that you've got things figured out quicker than your neighbor. If that were true, there would be a whole lot of other folks that never make it to heaven, right? It's by God's grace that we make it to heaven. That's why in Ephesians chapter 2, he says something pretty interesting. In Ephesians chapter 2, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, and someone reminded me that I say that a lot. That's fine. I have a lot of favorites in the Bible. But it says in Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. This whole process that allows us the opportunity to repent and believe in God is by God's grace. Not so that you can boast, so that you can look at those who haven't come to Christ and think that you are so much better than they, and man, if they had been raised right, and if, if this would have happened. It is by God's grace, not unto yourself, not anything in you that you have to boast about that brought you to salvation in Jesus Christ. It is a gift. Now, I'm a firm believer that you can reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think it was Jonathan Edwards that said, the only thing that we bring to salvation is the sin that made it necessary. That's what we bring to the table is our own sinfulness. But the repentance and the faith and that whole process is a gift of God. It's by his grace. It is, as our confession says, an evangelical grace over in Romans Chapter 1, I just want to read this to you. I said earlier that Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 is a good summary of the gospel. But he says in Romans 1, 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. It's by grace that we preach the gospel. It's by God's grace that we receive the gospel. Truth number three. Repentance and faith leads to holiness. Let's begin to put this whole picture together here. Repentance and faith, what is it? It signifies a turning from the power of Satan, from self to God. Okay, so your life, that's what... Conversion is about there's a change in your life. Conversion, regeneration, all of these things kind of accompany that point in time. Some of you can go back to the day, maybe even the hour that that happened in your life. Some of you is more of a gentle turning, but either way, whether it was a Damascus Road experience or whether you grew up in church, either way, there was a turning. Repentance is also a grace so that you can't sit here today and talk about how much better you are than all the other non-believers out there in the world. You boast in Christ and in Him alone. As far as you're concerned, as far as I'm concerned, we are the foremost of sinners. We are just sinners saved by the grace of God. But truth number three, repentance and faith leads to holiness. It leads to holiness. I want to go back to Acts chapter 26, where he talks about this idea of turning and repentance and so forth. And I want to point out just a couple of things in here. One, I want you to notice that it says in verse 18, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith. 
this word sanctification, not a word we throw around in average everyday conversations, but it is this process of us growing up in our salvation, maturing as believers in Jesus Christ. And this takes place by faith. We are sanctified by faith, okay? But notice something else down in verse 20. He says again, they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. So apparently the converts that Paul is talking about are not those who walk the aisle, get their ticket stamped to heaven, and then they go on about their life as they were already living beforehand. He says, performing deeds in keeping with repentance. We're coming up on the 500th anniversary of what is called the Protestant Reformation. And one of the big keynotes is we are saved by grace alone and through faith alone, to the glory of God alone, through Scripture alone, and in Christ alone. All right? So i got to get all those in there. My youth minister might come up here. But um, So, yeah, all the solas, if you will. But it's very important for us to understand what it means when we say by faith faith alone, and this concept of repentance. Genuine, true repentance is not divorced from works. It moves us to perform good deeds. That's why earlier when we read in Ephesians chapter 2, so yes, we're just saved by grace and through faith and, and not of works so that we have nothing to boast in. Amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And then you get to verse 10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I do want to ask you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews Chapter 11. Repentance and faith leads to holiness. So it sets you on this path towards holiness. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Skip down to verse 6. And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. This is what worship is about. This is what the Christian life is about. It's what sanctification is all about. It's about drawing near to God. It's about worshiping God, delighting in God, rejoicing in Christ. It's what the Christian life in some total is about. And the only way you get there by God's grace is through faith. And that's why when he holds up the hall of fame of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, you go through a little homework today, go through and read. It'll take you about five minutes to read Hebrews chapter 11. And you show me one soul in there who has faith, and it just says that he basically sat around at a Starbucks talking theology all day. Won't find a soul. Find me, show me someone in there who they just, faith, they just have this warm inner love for God, but that doesn't result in them doing anything. You can't find a soul in there. And that's why it says, by faith, and it talks about what Abraham did. Because it's intrinsically connected together. Over in Hebrews 11, verse 32, it says, And what more shall we say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and were made strong out of weakness and became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these 
though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. They did all of this driven by faith. There was a turning point in their life, and it changed everything about them. That's why the Bible speaks of you being a new creation. The old is gone, behold, the new has come. You know, a lot of people think that just one day we're just going to float up to heaven, spend eternity in heaven, that, that's all there is to it. But the Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth. That in Revelation 21 and 22, a little bit more homework, go read Revelation 21, 22, let it blow your mind, where heaven and earth come together, God makes all things new, the Bible says. And what we find in Jesus is he already started that process. He already started that process of resurrection. When Jesus raised up from the dead in the new heavens and the new earth, everything will be filled with the Holy Spirit and the glory of the Lord will cover the earth. Already got started to some degree in the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that you are a new creation, which means that God already started in you. And the way that you live your life should be an emblem to the world of what the kingdom of God is like and what the world and all creation will be like one day. And if that is not reflected in your life, if that's not reflected in your life, the Bible would encourage you to test your faith to see if it's real. Because if you know Christ, you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. This brings us to our fourth truth today. Repentance and faith in the gospel results in salvation. Now, I say repentance and faith in the gospel because uh, it's not just about just believing in anything, right? It's very specifically you are trusting in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not just trusting that, you know what, I don't want to go to hell. Believe I'll go to heaven. Well, any common sense person can figure that out, right? I mean, it's like, let's have a, uh, would you like an ice cream sundae or would you like me to beat you over the head with a stick? I think I'll take an ice cream sundae. Thank you very much. I mean, that's common sense. We're going to choose that if it were left up to us. But the reality is the gospel is far more revolutionary. The gospel is far more revolutionary than that message because the gospel says that Jesus is king. And our first allegiance is to him. We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that we love him above everything else in this life, that he is our great joy and our delight, far above anything that this world has to offer. And that's why if we want to be passionate about something in this life, be passionate about God and his kingdom. Repentance and faith in the gospel results in salvation. I want to ask you to turn one more time. Acts chapter 2, this will be the last time, unless I tell you to turn again. But um, Acts chapter 2, I told you about this earlier. He preaches the gospel, and just like his rhythm, at the end it's time to respond to the gospel. And so they ask what any pastor, anybody preaching prays that even if it's not verbalized, people are asking in their seats after a message. It says now in verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, if you want to be saved today, there is no other name given among men by where by we must be saved than the name of Jesus. This is the only name. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me except through Jesus. He's the only way. And you say, okay, so, so wh what's the big deal? What shall I do? Peter says, repent, okay? And I like to say that repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. You can't truly do one right without the other coming with it. If you're turning from darkness, there's only one light, 
Like you don't turn from darkness to another dark. You either turn from darkness to Christ or you hadn't turned at all. There's only one light, the light of the world. And so to truly repent means that you're turning from that darkness. You're turning from the power of Satan and to God. And you give yourself to him by grace and through faith. And if you want to have eternal life this morning, what Peter says, if you want to be saved, you've got to repent. As Baptists, we believe that after that repentance... It's marked out performing deeds in keeping with repentance. We'd say one of the first ones, if not the first one, is baptism. It's what Leighton, it's what Annie, it's what they were doing this morning. They'd repented of their sins, they'd trusted in Jesus Christ, and they're standing before their brothers and sisters in Christ, and they're saying, I belong to Christ. I have received the forgiveness of sins. I have been washed in the blood of the Lamb Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what this is all about. And if you have never, maybe you know the gospel, maybe you can articulate it better than me and anybody else in this room, but if you don't get to that response part, then what difference is there between you and any other lost person? Folks, I think the devil knows the gospel. He just hates it. He hates it. You may know the gospel, but have you repented of your sins and believed in Jesus for everlasting life and salvation? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. Maybe you just were coming to church this morning and checked that off your weekly to-do list, but maybe as you sit where you are, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. He's drawing you. Maybe you feel conviction of sin. Okay. Believe me, the devil is going to be working too. He's going to say, sit right there. Don't worry about it. You can do this another week. Think about who's sitting next to you. Think about who's sitting around you. And yet the Bible says, perform deeds in keeping with repentance. And in a Baptist church, one of the first things we do is we stand up, we walk the aisle, and we say, I'm coming down today because I want to repent of my sins and trust in Jesus Christ. And we walk you through that process. That's what we're here for. I'll be standing down here, Matt, Kyle, I'll be standing down here to walk you through that. If you've never trusted in Jesus, today's the day. So I'm going to pray for you, and then you might fall into one of three categories. You might be one who's never trusted in Jesus. I pray you'd make that right today. I'm not trying to force you to do anything, but the Bible talks about obeying the gospel, the obedience of faith. It's not just an invitation to come and do something that we're suggesting for you to do. It is a command of God to repent and believe in the gospel. And so if that's you today, I pray that you will obey the gospel this morning. Maybe somebody else, you've repented of your sins and trusted in Christ before, but you've never followed through with believer's baptism. Today's the day. Maybe as you sit where you are, you're not actually a member of this church or any other church or whatever, and and you're not connected actively with a local body of Christ. And if we were to keep on reading in Acts chapter 2, that comes next. That's part of repentance and faith. You get in a body of Christ, and you live there. So maybe you're in one of those three categories. I don't know your situation, but if so, and if the Spirit's leading you, I pray that you'll obey our Father this morning who loves you. Gracious Lord, I pray today that you would woo us and draw us, that we would delight in you above all other things, that you would calm our hearts for those that need to be calmed. Others of us, perhaps, those waters in our heart have been calmed for way too long. It's time to get stirred up again. Whatever the Spirit does, Father, I just pray that you're glorified and exalted in this church is strengthened. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand. The altar's open. Whatever God leads you to do, I pray that you would be faithful in following his will this morning.